Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Crop Hour. Um, my name is Patrick Wagner. I'm the entomology field specialist uh, based out in uh, Rapid City. Um, I wanted to just thank everyone for joining us this morning uh, as we kind of continue our sunflower week. Uh, today, we're going to transition into talking about insect topics as they relate to uh, sunflower production here in South Dakota. And today we're going to be starting with uh, talking about insect pests. And then tomorrow we're gonna kind of continue that insect conversation by talking about pollinators. So please join us for that um, discussion as well tomorrow, um, if you can. If you need the CCA credits, uh, we will have that QR code available here at the end of um, the presentation today. Um, and then also following that presentation, uh, we will have that informal discussion. So uh, please join us for that. I wanna introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Adam Varenhorst. He is our entomology uh, state specialist based out in Brookings. Uh, it's a little bit of background with Adam here. He, he got his bachelor's degree in 2009 from uh, Briarcliff University. He got his master's degree and his PhD from Iowa State University, graduated in 2015. And since then, he's been here uh, working at South Dakota State University. Uh, so he, he covers a variety of different crops um, here in South Dakota, and he's gonna be talking about uh, sunflower today. Uh, his topic for today is gonna be above and below ground sunflower insect pests. So Adam, if you wanna share your slides there, um, just one last thing, if you have any questions during the presentation, I um, ask you to just put those, you know, feel free to drop them into the Q&A or the, the chat and we can address those at the end. So I will turn it over to you, Adam, take it away. All right. Well, thanks, Pat, and thanks for the introduction and good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending today's talk. So as Pat uh, indicated, I will be talking about above ground and below ground sunflower insect pests. Since I only had an hour long uh, time slot here, I had to cut back a little bit. So we're not going to cover them all. We are going to cover quite a few though. And so we'll start off with, in South Dakota, what's probably the, the most economically challenging insect pest. It's the red sunflower seed weevil. Now in neighboring states like North Dakota, this pest isn't quite as much of an issue as it has been in South Dakota for the last few years. In South Dakota, this is an annual pest. A lot of our insect pests and sunflower are native to the US, and this one is also. And the reason that we have a lot of these native pests is wild sunflower is endemic to uh, the United States. And so a lot of our insect pests have actually evolved with the sunflower. And then a lot of our commercial varieties initially were bred in uh, other countries and developed. And as a result, we don't have a lot of resistance traits uh, to these pests because uh, there weren't insect pests uh, in those countries that we necessarily see here. So with the red sunflower seed weevil, if populations are left unchecked, no applications of insecticides are done to try to reduce populations, you can see 50 to 80% of the developing seeds, the achenes being infested. And the larvae feed on developing seeds. They don't consume the entire seed, but they feed on it enough that they will cause issues. Another big problem with the red sunflower seed weevil is most of the time they will drop out of that developing seed. The larvae kind of crawl back out and drop to the soil to overwinter. But if you harvest a little too early and the larvae are still in the seeds, they can cause some issues with storage. So it's one of those things where you're going to have damaged damage seeds, uh, which won't be uh, as marketable. And then also as, for storage, you can have some spoilage uh, due to having this uh, corpse of the larvae as they uh, eventually will die in there and uh, cause some rotting issues. Now, these are primarily managed using foliar insecticides. There has been a little bit of research looking into resistance traits uh, for this pest. Uh, and, but so far, none of those are going to be available uh, on the commercial market. Now, I said we're having a lot of problems with these in South Dakota. 
the threshold for red sunflower seed weevils is four to six adult weevils per head. That's an average for the field. In South Dakota, we're seeing populations that range from uh, 40 to 600 uh, weevils per head. So we're a little bit over that threshold. And a lot of times I don't have the video. I've seen videos of people that are scouting that have these fields where the thresholds are just, uh, the populations have greatly exceeded the thresholds. And it looks like the weevils are uh, swimming across the head. It, you would not understand uh, at first glance that there's insects on there. You'd think that there's the wind blowing the little flowers. You look closer and it's just weevils crawling back and forth. And in this picture here, I wanted to show that these weevils aren't the easiest thing to see on the head. And a lot of times they're actually, they'll kind of uh, crawl down and be down into the flowers a little bit so you can't just count them. But you know you might have a problem when you go out to the field and before you spray your bug repellent on to draw them out so you can count them, you can see more than the threshold. So right here, we have three, four, five, at least six that are really easily visible. And if we dig more, there's more on this head. And I mentioned bug repellent, that's typically how we scout if we're trying to count all the weevils. We take something that has DET in it, we'll spray it on the head and that uh, is a insect repellent. So the insects start to crawl out of the head trying to get away from that insect repellent. And following these really large populations, we started receiving field failure reports for insecticides in South Dakota uh, a few years ago. And at first thought we were thinking, well, maybe it's just these really large populations and we're actually just not uh, reducing the population 100%. And then we're uh, the reason we're getting these field failure reports is because there are still insects out there and it looks like the insecticides didn't work on them. But in a couple efficacy trials we've conducted, we've seen that the products do look like they work pretty well and we do kill a lot of weevils as shown here. These are all dead red sunflower seed weevils after a spray. And so we were killing a lot, but we were noticing that we even were having some that were still crawling around and uh, we were applying these on foot. And typically when insecticides are applied to sunflowers, they're going to be applied uh, with an airplane. And so we were thinking maybe we would have a little bit higher coverage with our method, but we still were seeing some weevils. And that really got me thinking, well, what kind of insecticides are really available for managing red sunflower seed weevils? And at first glance, we have 47 different insecticide products labeled for red sunflower seed weevil management in South Dakota. And you might think, wow, there's a lot of options, but let's dig a little bit deeper. 29 of those have a pyrethroid active ingredient. If we take a step further there, 24 of those all have lambda cyhelithrin as an active ingredient. So those are products uh, that you might be most familiar with are like your lambda psi or uh, the more uh, popular one that I've heard a lot about is warrior two, uh, the more common. And so you have some of these products that uh, have been used a lot, they work well. Another active ingredient there with one product is esfenvelerate. A lot of people have talked to me about that one for red sunflower seed weevil management. So we don't have a lot of diversity in the pyrethroid group for red sunflower seed weevil management. Out of those 47, three uh, have at least one pyrethroid active ingredient and then something else. In some cases, those other products in there don't actually work against red sunflower seed weevils. They might be in there for caterpillars. And then we have 13 with organophosphates. I just realized I'm going through my numbers. They don't add up to 47. So uh, it looks like we're down a couple and I didn't get my 47 updated. So we're actually a little bit lower. Uh, and some of that has to do with uh, one major company stopped producing uh, their products that contain chlorpyrifos last year. And so if you have mark, uh, if you have stores of those, you can continue using them. It, it hasn't been banned or anything. It just, uh, the company decided to stop producing it. Uh, but that the result is we do have fewer products available, but the big takeaway message from this is we never had a lot of diversity in our active ingredients for red sunflower seed weevils. And, and 
reality, not a lot for a lot of our insect pests and sunflowers. And so maybe it's more realistic than that we actually do have field failures uh, with these products because if the same class or same active ingredients being used routinely, we know that that can drive resistance. So from 2017 through 2020, every year we've had at least one field failure report uh, sent to SDSU. And the big question is, and if you notice, I don't say, is it resistance? I say, is it reduced susceptibility to these products? And the reason I can't say, is it resistance is we don't have a population of red sunflower seed weevils in the greenhouse at South Dakota State University. We would need that population to compare what we're testing in the field to see what 100% it's been kept in a greenhouse so it's never been challenged by an insecticide population would look like compared to what we're seeing in the field. Another issue we've had in the past, this year, uh, last year in 2020, we were actually able to get out into a field before it was retreated was because this is such an economically important pest, a lot of times we get the field failure report and the fields are retreated in some cases the same day. Uh, so we can't get out there and sample the individuals that survive to see what's going on with them. So to try to determine what was going on for the last couple of years, we've been using what we call a glass vial assay. And so if we say we're doing an efficacy study, that means we have the research plots out in the field and we spray those, we count the weevils, we determine how well the products work. With glass vial assays, they're set up a little bit differently in that we go out to fields and randomly sample the adults. We collect the bunch, we bring them back to our labs, and then we let them rest, and then we test them. And so the whole purpose of a glass vial assay is we're able to sample a lot of fields from a larger geographical area to really see what's happening. So for our glass vial assay, we used four treatments. One of the treatments was acetone. And if you're familiar with that, that's not an insecticide that's actually used in these glass vial assays because it helps the products dry a little bit faster. It's a very volatile compound. And so we use that, but we also have to make sure that it isn't killing the insects. So we have one set of vials with just the acetone uh, that's put in them and then dried. And then we have what are referred to as technical grade insecticides. And so these aren't the ones that you're buying in formulation. These are just the active ingredient. And then we dilute them down in the acetone so that we get the right concentrations of what would be getting used in the actual product. And so we had Lambda Cyhalothrin, Esfenvalerate, and Zeta Zypermethrin for our active ingredients. So those are all three pyrethroid class insecticides. For the red sunflower seed weevil adults, we collected those at the onset of flowering this year. And the reason we went out earlier was, as I mentioned, uh, you know, if we wait too long, they might get sprayed and then we'd be getting these field failure reports. And a previous round of this glass vial assay, we were concerned that we may have sampled too late and a lot of the adults that we were collecting may have already been challenged by the insecticide application so of course we're going to be seeing what looks like a lot of reduced susceptibility in those populations because those are the ones that survived. And so we needed to get a better perspective of, you know, out of an entire field, what's it look like? So we went out really early, pretty much as the earliest we could start finding large populations of the red sunflower seed weevils out in the fields. And we'd start collecting those and bring them back. In South Dakota, we sampled 12 locations and our colleagues in North Dakota sampled from nine locations. So we're doing a collaborative study here to try to see if we have similarities in the issue between the two states or if one state has more problems than the other. So we'd bring those adults back, we'd put them into a insect cage. So uh, think of it as kind of an insect hotel. We provided food, water, uh, we put sunflower heads in from sunflower plots where we know there had not been any insecticide application. And so essentially we we're trying to make the adults uh, comfortable. And then we'd go back after 24 hours and select the ones that we are going to use for our test. The reason we waited that 24 hour period is sometimes when you're collecting red sunflower seed weevils, you will have some uh, casualties you don't mean to, but when you're 
hitting the sunflower head into a bag. Sometimes some of, some of those adults will be injured. Some of them may just not have been going to live very long. So we try to select ones that are alive after that 24 hour period, just to ensure that we have pretty healthy individuals. And then we place them into our glass vial assay. We put those 10 adults in there, into each vial. We sealed the vial. And then we let them sit in the vial with the insecticides for 24 hours. At the end of that, we went through and determined who was alive, who was dead, and uh, who was in the in-between stage, which still were counted as dead because uh, in some cases those weren't going to recover. Uh, they just weren't dying as quickly. And so for our insecticides that we used, we had two rates, uh, which we called normal and low. Uh, the normal were going to be the highest labeled rate for those products for red sunflower seed weevils. So we we're going off the labels uh, for these values. So for lambda cyhalothrin, we had 1.92 fluid ounces per acre. The S1 valerate, 9.6 fluid ounces per acre. And zeta zypermethrin, 4 fluid ounces per acre. The reason we chose these values was we wanted to be able to have the closest picture of what farmers were going to be seeing out in the field. So if you're using the highest labeled rates, we wanted to see how well those were going to work in our assay. We also went with the lowest labeled rates. Uh, I have an asterisk on the zeta zypermethrin. I'll get there uh, why that's there. But for lambda cyhalothrin, we used 0.96 fluid ounces per acre. The S and Valorate, 5.8 fluid ounces per acre. And the zeta zypermethrin, uh, 1.28 fluid ounces per acre. Now, there was a clerical error with the zeta zypermethrin because on the label, there's actually two different low labeled rates. One of those is for red sunflower seed weevils and a couple other insects. And one is for insects not including red sunflower seed weevils. That clerical error was that we selected the one that didn't actually work for red sunflower seed weevils. So we weren't using the right low labeled rate. So uh, the results we see for the lower zeta zypermethrin need to be taken with a grain of salt because it might not be the effective rate. And so if we see a lot of survival, it might be because of that, not necessarily reduced susceptibility. And so here are our sampling locations for South Dakota. I should note that a lot of our field failure reports are from Hughes County. So if you notice, we kind of stacked up and had a lot of sampling in that county. It's because we wanted to see if we could find uh, some of these issues with field failure reports. We had one location out here where we actually didn't sample before insecticide application. That was our field failure report in 2020. And so we went out there and we wanted to check and see what things look like. We also went out closer to Rapid City. We didn't have any field failure reports from this area, but we wanted to see what the populations out there in Sunflower look like in comparison to some from areas where we may have had some issues in the past. So I'm going to show quite a few graphs in a row here. They're all going to be set up pretty similarly. The big difference is going to be the location up on the top. But over here on the y-axis is mean corrected mortality plus you see SEM, that's the standard error of the mean. That standard error is these little bars here. So that tells us if there's variation within our treatment and how much. So it gives us an idea if, you know, we had one treatment uh, where in one vial, one individual survived and the rest of them maybe larger amounts survived. Uh, it shows us that variation and can tell us that, well, maybe there is something going on, but it's hard to say. The mean corrected mortality is calculated by taking that untreated, so the acetone vial, and looking at the survival in that and then correcting all of our treatments to that survival. The reason we do that is if we had a batch of weevils that did not survive well in our untreated control, we wanna correct that survival to what we are seeing in that vial so that it doesn't look like we had uh, really weird numbers in the actual treatments themselves. And so uh, this is a method that's used pretty widely in entomology and we used it for this, just to make sure we had a fair comparison for all the treatments. So down here, we have our lambda cyhalothrin, s valerate, and zeta zypermethrin. And then the blue bars are the low rate and the 
yellow bars are the standard rate or the standard high rate. So for our first location out in Pennington County, we didn't really see a lot. Everything pretty much was at 100% or one. So if we're at one, that means everything died when we had it in the vial. And that's good news. We wanna see that. We wanna see that the vials had uh, high mortality. That is when we put the weevils in, they didn't survive. That's what we want with these insecticides. Ideally with insecticides, you want somewhere in that 98 to 100% ideally. Um, so somewhere about right here to 100, that tells you that you had very good effect of the product. Anything below that starts to become a little worrisome. And for our second location out in Pennington County, again, we may have had some numerical decreases, uh, but again, nothing that was statistically different from one or 100%. And so not a lot of evidence of an issue. This isn't really surprising. We haven't received any field failure reports from that area. So populations out there seem to be pretty susceptible to the products. Oh, this is our field failure report location. If you notice, we have a lot of variation now in our bars. So uh, one of the things we see is that we have the, the total average represented by the top of our bars is decreased for a lot of our treatments. You will notice that we had some variation though with these standard air bars. That just means that within that treatment, the individuals that wasn't across the board all survived, all died. There was some survived, some didn't. The asterisks here represent if it was significant from one. So for our low rate lambda cyhalothrin, we actually saw a statistical difference from one indicating that there was really something going on there. Uh, since that's the lower rate, maybe that's not as much of a surprise because ideally you'd be using this, the higher standard rate uh, when you're trying to manage these pests. But still something to be concerned about. One of the things we noticed across the board though is we had these numerical decreases. And that's something that's a little bit concerning because that means even though if we can't say it's significant, there's still something that's going to be observed uh, when, out there when you're re-scouting after application, there's going to be some individuals alive. And then we saw a significant difference for our low rate zeta zypromethrin, but remember that might not be the right rate uh, or is effective for red sunflower seed weevils. So we did see some evidence for the lambda cyhalothrin. What's interesting was this field failure report was actually for S. Valerate. So uh, we didn't see significant differences there, but there were the numerical ones. We're going to move now to Hughes County. So if you're familiar with that area, Canning Road was our landmark. So a lot of the fields were on or just slightly off Canning Road. So for our first location in Hughes County, we don't see a lot of issues for the Lambda Cyhalothrin Esfen Valerate treatments, maybe a little bit of numerical responses, but nothing that was significant. For our Zeta Zypromethrin, again, our low rate looked like it was significant, but we take that with a grain of salt. Our second location, these weren't right on top of one another in Canyon Road, they are spread out in Hughes County, saw that there were some numerical responses for the Lambda Cyhalothrin, but nothing that was significant. But then for S. Valerate, we actually saw that both the low rate and the standard rate were significantly reduced from that one. So we were seeing survival uh, that was quite a bit in comparison to what we would expect with 100% mortality. Our next location still in Hughes County was closer to Blunt. And we saw that both the low and the standard rates for Zeta Zypromethrin were significantly different from one. And this we take with a grain of salt, but this was the right rate. So the standard rate here looks like it was having a major issue. Our next location in Hughes County, which was uh, also near Blunt, we didn't see anything that was standing out too much. So not a lot of issues, although we did see some numerical responses, which might indicate that if we sampled more in that area, we might find something. And so now we're moving, uh, still in Hughes County, but moving closer to Harold. We didn't see anything uh, for the Lambda Cyhalothrin or S. Valerate, but we did see again, take with a grain of salt, the Zeta Zypromethrin low rate. So uh, the trend here is that this 
lower than what we should have been using rate probably was really uh, not effective against the red sunflower seed weevils. So it goes to show the importance of using the labeled rates for these products because uh, those rates have been tested to determine that they will be effective against the population to some extent. Now we're moving uh, still in Hughes County, but we're by the junction now of 14 and 83. And so uh, we see not a lot for the Lambda Cyhalothrin or S. Valerate treatments, but both the low and the standard rate. So this is the one we're really focusing on for Zeta Zypermethrin, we're significantly different from one. The junction two location, we see some numerical responses still for that Zeta Zypermethrin, but nothing was significantly different. And so our next location, we move now from Hughes to Sully County. And this one has a lot going on. So we see numerical reductions in the effectiveness of those treatments, but we also see significant differences from one for the standard rate lambda cyhalothrin, both rates of s valerate. And this one was different, but we still do see a little bit of a response for the standard rate zeta zypromethrin. Uh, so this was our first location where we saw that we had issues with both the Lambda and the s Valorate, uh, where we saw significant differences from one. So there was a lot of survival here. And so that's going to be very noticeable when you're out scouting. If you think about, we're only testing 10 weevils per vial. We have some replication. So we had six, six vials per treatment per location, but still you're looking at a lot of survival on a field scale. Our next location is still in Sully County. This is uh, a little bit closer to Oneida. Uh, didn't see a lot, we saw some numerical responses, but we did see that for the standard rate Zeta Zypermethrin, there was a significant differences from one. So that was all of our South Dakota data. Uh, for North Dakota, uh, this was a collaborative study and uh, they tested nine locations. So here's their map to show you, uh, they were spread out within the state. So uh, I should note they haven't had field failure reports for red sunflower seed weevils there, uh, but they were interested in seeing if maybe they were having populations similar to ours. And the takeaway message from this is they tested nine locations, but with data, if the locations aren't significantly different from one another, we can pool them together. And I was able to do that with North Dakota's data. So there's only the one graph, it's the combined data from all nine locations. If we look here, everything is pretty much right at one. So they had very good uh, mortality, everything died. And that's what we would have liked to see in South Dakota as well. So it doesn't look like North Dakota is seeing a lot of the same issues as we are. So the big conclusions we took from the 2020 data is that there does look like there's reduced susceptibility uh, to some of these products in South Dakota. We had issues with Lambda Cyhalothrin at two locations, s Valorate at two locations, and an asterisk here, Zeta Zypermethrin at seven locations. However, if we correct for that low rate not being labeled for red sunflower seed weevils, we only see three locations that had issues with the standard rate. And moving forward, we will be correcting that lower labeled rate for 2021 uh, to make sure that we're having a fair comparison for that treatment. And so, Another very interesting thing is that for the North Dakota sites, there were no signs of reduced susceptibility. One of the things we're going to be doing as we move forward with this study in 2021 is we're going to be evaluating additional locations in South Dakota. I said we kind of clustered in Hughes County. That was important because that's where a lot of our issues were uh, being called in from. But I think we need to sample some additional counties where sunflowers are grown to make sure we're not missing uh, populations elsewhere that may also be having issues. Uh, so we're going to be spreading out a little bit. We'll still sample quite a bit in Hughes County, but we're going to be adding locations uh, this year just to try to get a more robust data set. And you know, thinking about it, why might we have these susceptibility issues in South Dakota? Well, one of the first things that comes to mind is the coverage on sunflowers to get really good coverage for red sunflower seed weevils. It is difficult. Uh, these aren't just sitting on the head waiting for the spray. They're going to be down in uh, kind of burrowing 
into the, the flowers a little bit so that they're covered. That's going to make it harder to get really good coverage. Timing, timing of the spray can have a lot of impact. Uh, and so it's just tough to get really good uh, coverage for these pests. We also have these huge red sunflower seed weevil populations in some areas, which kind of attributes to that coverage difficulty because if they're swarming, uh, you're not going to get good coverage on every single one. And so you're, it's going to be very hard to reduce that full population. Another thing that's getting uh, needs to be thought about is that pretty much every year we do treat for red sunflower seed weevil. And with that limited toolbox, as far as the insecticides go and the active ingredients, we probably are seeing uh, repeated uses of some of these same active ingredients, maybe not in the same field, but think about the neighborhood. Uh, we don't know how far red sunflower seed weevils can move as, in terms of from field to field. We know they probably are moving at least within neighborhoods because you're not planting sunflower in the same field year after year. These do overwinter in the previous sunflower fields because they drop out of the heads, they go into the soil to overwinter. And so in the spring, they're emerging as adults and then they're hunting out for those sunflower fields. And so uh, one of the things we think going forward is still really important is that timing that we do this assay during because uh, I think it does really influence our results and making sure that we don't just sample fields that have already been sprayed. And so I mentioned we had efficacy studies in the past, uh, but in 2020, we had a little bit of an issue with our sunflower efficacy study. And so this is our field. And first question, when this picture got sent to me, I was doing some other work in the Brookings area and I had a student in, uh, employee out looking at this plot and they sent this picture back and said, you know, my first thing is what happened to the leaves? If you look, we're pretty much 100% stripped here. And so I first thought maybe it was a hailstorm. But if you look this picture, it's kind of hard because it's a cell phone picture, but I was noticing there's stuff on the heads. Uh, what the heck's going on with that field? And then they followed up with this picture. They probably could have led with this picture, uh, but we had grasshoppers, a uh, huge population of two-stripe grasshoppers that showed up in the pier area. It wasn't just our plots. Uh, there were a lot of people that were having issues with grasshoppers last year. And so if grasshoppers are left unmanaged as they were, because this was supposed to be a study evaluating insecticides for red sunflower seed weevils. So we, uh, we didn't see grasshoppers the one week when we scouted. The next week we didn't have leaves. But because the grasshoppers had fed so extensively on the heads, uh, some of the heads have been clipped. And also because uh, it turns out if you have a lot of grasshoppers, you don't have a lot of red sunflower seed weevils. Uh, we didn't end up spraying this uh, this year just because there was so much damage as well as the fact that the weevil populations kind of disappeared once the grasshoppers showed up. But that brings us to an important point. Grasshoppers like dry conditions. If we look at our 2020 weather conditions, it was a little bit dry later in the season to pretty dry and we had a pretty nice fall. Grasshoppers really benefit from warm falls. And so we had a pretty warm fall. Our frost was you know, not as early as it could have been. And as a result of that, we probably had a lot of egg laying by these grasshopper populations that we were noticing in that area. And this doesn't just apply for the pier area. Anywhere uh, that's going to be a little drier moving into 2021, we really need to monitor for grasshopper populations, even in sunflower. The three species we really watch for in South Dakota are the differential grasshopper, the two-stripe grasshopper, and also the red-legged grasshopper. These three species, these two are pretty big. They stand out. These are going to be kind of a green yellow, but they have these dark markings on their leg here, these chevrons that helps identify them. Two-stripe grasshoppers get their name because they have these light stripes, kind of white to yellow, depending on uh, the individual you're looking at, that start at their head and then they converge here on the abdomen. And then the red-legged grasshopper, which is considerably smaller than these two species, and it gets its name because this leg right, part of the leg right here is red. Uh, so these are the three species to watch for. And populations will tend to be worse during dry years. 
Uh, part of that is because during the normal year, you will always have grasshoppers. But as long as the grass and the ditches and, you know, field margins is green, they're going to be happy and stay there. Once that dries down, though, they're going to start heading into crops to try to find green foliage. And when the foliage disappears, they're going to move to the heads because they're looking for anything that they can feed on. So it's going to be important here for this next year to really monitor grasshopper populations starting in the spring. Watch for the nymphs. If you start seeing a lot of nymphs, it might be time to pull the management trigger because their threat of defoliation is going to be a lot worse later in the season. And it's going to be worse on the edges of the field because as I mentioned, they head into the field from the field margins. And if you get head feeding like we saw or head clipping, that's a major source of damage and pretty quick yield loss. So it's something to really watch out for. Now we scout for grasshoppers and sunflowers using visual counts. In most crops we talk about using sweep nets and then you'd sweep net and figure out how many adults or nymphs you had per 30 sweeps. If you've ever walked through a sunflower field and tried to use a sweep nut, you'd know that it's not going to work at all. Uh, it's, those plants are just not set up for sweep nut sampling. You knock all the leaves off and you'd probably get beat up pretty bad by the sunflower heads. So uh, the best thing to do is you go out into the field, stand in a few different spots. So start on the edge and move in and then maybe go to another edge. And you stand still for a couple minutes and you just count how many grasshoppers you see on the plants or moving around. And so in a square yard, if you see 30 to 45 nymphs, that's it's time to spray or if you see eight to 14 adults. Now, part of the threshold that's not listed here is if you go out into your field, and you notice the leaves on the sunflower disappearing like we saw, it's probably time to spray if you still have heads. Once the head clipping starts, if it's really extensive, it's probably too late. Uh, those sprays are going to be more of a revenge spray. So you really want to try to catch these before they get that thick and before that much damage is being done. As I mentioned, that can happen with these large populations in about a week. Uh, so uh, we, we were about seven days apart in sampling that plot. And in seven days, we had major differences uh, occur as far as those populations and the damage. If you do have grasshoppers, there are quite a few of our products in the pest management guide that are labeled for sunflower and grasshopper management. If you're treating adults, it will take a much higher rate though. So you'll need to go up to that higher end of the standard rate to manage those. Adult grasshoppers are more robust. They're big, they're tough. If you're spraying the nymphs, you don't need to use that max rate. You can typically use somewhere in the middle uh, in some cases, they'll even have notes on the labels to tell you optimized rates for nymphs versus adults. So our next above ground pest are the longhorn Dectes stem borers. We say they're longhorn because they have really long antenna. If you bend the antenna back over the body, they're longer than the body. But the Dectes stem bore can be a really big issue during dry years. So it's very important that we talk about it with what's going to potentially be an issue here in 2021. The adults themselves aren't the issue. It's these larvae here. They're legless, they have brown heads, and they kind of have this accordion shaped body. You might be thinking, well, what do they do? Well, if we think about the name, boar, they're going to be in the stems. And all this feeding and discoloration here, that's not really the big issue. There have been a lot of studies that doesn't look like there's a lot of yield loss associated with just having them feed. Part of that is in a plant, you'll really only ever see one of these guys. They're territorial, even though multiple eggs might be laid in on one plant, you're, they're going to actually kill one another off until there's just the one. The larvae will bore into the stalk and at the, towards the end of the season or when dry can, uh, it's a little bit drier, they'll start moving down towards the soil surface. When they get close to the soil surface, they're going to girdle the stalk. So they'll start in the middle here and they feed outwards. And then they'll move down once they girdle, they'll move down, they enclose themselves in the base of the stalk to overwinter. And the whole purpose of this girdling here when they feed is they wanna make sure it's going to be easy to get out next year as an adult. And so when you girdle, the whole point is, is that it's kind of like you're waiting for the plant to fall over 
and then you'll be able to just emerge from your overwintering site. So what do we do about these? Well, we can't really use insecticides. They're not effective because the larvae are in the plant and the adults don't emerge at one big time point. So we can't spray adults to really knock the populations down. So one of the things we can do is use lower planting populations. And the whole point of that is, and these are obviously not your standard size stems. I had to draw them up a little bit so it's easier to see. Lower planting populations typically result in larger stem diameters. These guys are, think about they're tunneling here in the center of the stalk they go up and down the stem. When they feed out, they can only get about half an inch out from the center. So they can only feed about half an inch out and then they feed around until they get tired. Then they go back down. If you have stalks or stems that are a little bit larger in diameter, these guys are going to feed out as far as they can. They're going to wear out. And then you're still though going to have plant tissue available beyond where they could feed so you shouldn't have lodging. And so your slender stems will be girdled sooner and you will have more lodging. Dry conditions plus stem, uh, slender stems mean you're going to have earlier lodging and it's going to be more extensive. So these are one of those pests that best way to really manage them is to just have lower plant populations so the stems are bigger. There are some other things that are recommended uh, one of them is that in heavily infested fields, you go out and harvest even if the moisture content isn't at optimal conditions. Uh, so that's not the best option, but the whole reason they even have prompt harvest in there for recommendations is because if you wait too long, you're going to have a lot of lodging and that's going to make harvest even more difficult. So uh, in the past, when we have dry years, these can be a huge issue in some of our previous National Sunflower Association sunflower surveys, which actually will be occurring this year. Uh, we've seen that in South Dakota and other states, uh, the infestation of Dectes is pretty extensive. Sometimes in fields, we, every plant you look at has a larvae in it. Sometimes you don't see it that, that much, but almost every field we typically look at has these in it. And so we don't always have a lot of lodging issues though. And a lot of that has to do with the, they can't feed all the way through the stem and then we don't get the lodging. So it's something to really think about. These are worse during dry years. And part of that's because they're, they're going to move down and start doing that girdling earlier because plant conditions are going to deteriorate a little bit faster and they're going to want to get ready to overwinter as soon as possible. So uh, something to just really think about and monitor for as we go into 2021. If we get a lot of moisture, uh, that's going to be good on many fronts uh, and then in terms of Dectes, maybe they won't be as much of an issue. Another above ground pest we watch for are banded sunflower moths. Uh, these can be an issue in South Dakota. We do have these. They get their name because the little moths, which are pretty small, they're about a half an inch in length from front to back. They have these dark brown bands. It's the caterpillars that are also pretty small that cause the issues. And these will be in the fields from June to July as moths. The caterpillars will uh, vary a little bit in color. Typically, you won't even see them because you can see these holes here. Uh, eventually, they're going to feed into the seeds and then be feeding on that developing seed. Uh, there's a couple different ways to scout for these. The one that we recommended is uh, scout for eggs on the bracts starting at the R3 stage and then determine the distance into the field. There's a couple equations. I didn't list them here. They're, they are available in uh, extension articles that you use to determine how far into the field you need to actually treat. So typically these are more of an issue on the edges of the field, but they can move into the field as well. Alternatively, you can scout for the adults. Uh, the reason the eggs are nice is once you start noticing the eggs, you know you have a population out in the field. And so you can monitor and there are pretty good uh, uh, information available to tell you how long you have before you need to treat. So. The egg scouting gives you a little bit better window for management uh, than just scouting for the adults. And you really don't for those who want to scout for the larva because it's going to be hard to see those. The next pest is the sunflower head moth. These are another pretty small moth. These actually overwinter down south and then they migrate north each year. They all larvae have kind of a dark 
orange head, and then dark body with white stripes. The threshold is one to two adults per five heads. We uh, don't really scout a lot for these. We know we have them. You'll know you have this larva because if you have a bunch of webbing on the head, so the dried florets kind of get caught in those, probably have some sunflower uh, head moth or sunflower moth present. And so uh, the issue there though, is that these guys will actually burrow through the uh, head. And so they allow for pathogens to get in. And also when they are creating that webbing, you can get moisture in that debris and that can cause some additional head rotting. Also, you just uh, will lose some yield just to their feeding activities. So that's all I have for the major above ground pests. For the rest of the talk, we're going to talk about below ground insect pests. So what are our major early season below ground pests? Number one, we have wireworms. We also can see some white grub issues, although these tend to be more of an issue if you had a field that was long-term grass, uh, or if you just are, I guess, in those areas where the white grub populations are pretty high, sometimes they'll move into a field. And then pale striped flea beetles. We don't talk about pale striped flea beetles a lot anymore because since uh, pyrethroid seed treatments, uh, sorry, neonicotinoid seed treatments have been utilized in sunflower, these guys haven't been as much of an issue. So you can still see pale striped flea beetles out in a field, but we don't really see those populations uh, like we did before neonicotinoid seed treatments where you would actually have this serious defoliation and stand reduction. And then another pest we always watch for in the spring are cutworms. So the main ones we watch for in sunflower are dingy cutworms. Uh, they can be a real nuisance here in South Dakota. But one of the issues we run into with early season pests is how do you treat them? So we know they're there. Maybe we went out and scouted for wireworms. We put out the sentinel bait traps. We know we have a wireworm population. What do we do? Or we have a white grub. Well, uh, there aren't emergency treatments. So once the crop's in the ground, for these guys, uh, you're going to be looking at, well, I should have done this or I could have done this. Uh, that's, that's one of the issues we run into with some of these early season below ground pests. Infro insecticides can be pretty effective against both wireworms and white grubs. As I mentioned, insecticide seed treatments are really effective against pale striped flea beetles, not as effective against white grubs, and they will deter feeding for wireworms, but they typically don't kill the wireworm. And then uh, alternative for your uh, cutworms is you can use T-band or Inferro insecticides at plant, or for cutworms, you can come in with a rescue treatment and you can use a foliar insecticide and you will reduce the feeding from those. So uh, those are your options. But one of the things we know is that not a lot of people are using the Inferro or T-band insecticides. In some cases, their planters aren't set up for it. So we're relying a lot on the insecticide seed treatments, but they're not real effective for some of our early season pests. And if you think about it, if all sunflower are treated with an insecticide seed treatment or we're just using inferrals all the time, what about integrated pest management where we're trying to use multiple strategies to manage pests? And also in sunflower, we really don't have any sound management recommendations for these early season pests. And even after we conducted a study, we still don't because uh, one of the issues we run into is these pests are so variable. They're very sporadic. Uh, so it, we never got a really good idea for how many you need to have in the soil to actually treat them. And so what pests are we you know, really managing on a yearly basis? We're putting money towards pest management, but what's out there and is it effective? Another issue we run into is, and this hasn't come up as much in the last couple of years, but back in 2014, a lot of people, myself included, were a little surprised because there was a general call to reduce the use of neonicotinoid seed treatments. And there was actually a report uh, conducted and filed by the EPA that said that there was no benefit to the use of neonicotinoid seed treatments in soybean. And so there was some concern that Maybe it's just a matter of time until we see some reports for other crops, but uh, we really wanted to see if there was evidence of a benefit for sunflowers. So we had some, some idea of if we had a, a way to, you know, say we actually need these treatments here besides just for pale striped flea beetles. So the big question we had were, are seed treatments and sunflowers economical? Are they effective? 
is there a reason to be using them? Uh, so this was a multi-state study with North Dakota and South Dakota. I'll only be showing the South Dakota data. And the first thing we had to do is find wireworms. So those were kind of our target insect pests. We thought those were probably what we were having issues with in most of our fields where we're having early season problems because as I mentioned, white grubs are a little bit more sporadic and they tend to be more of an issue uh, closer to grasses or in rotation after you moved out of grasses for a few years. So we sampled numerous fields. This is actually a golf cup hole cutter. We use that to get a big soil core. We'd throw it in a bucket and then we'd sift through there and see if we had wireworms. Once we found some wireworms, we would use that field then for the study. So for our experimental design, we had six treatments. We had our untreated. So these were just untreated sunflower. We had two different seed treatments. They were both Cruiser 5FS, but we had our standard rate and then we had a high rate. So this isn't actually labeled, but this is, we're just curious, if you throw more product on, do you actually see a benefit of that? And then we had in furrows, which included Mustang Max, Capture LFR and Ethos XB. We planted these plots using small plot planter. Uh, the first year we didn't have this planter. Uh, we are using a cone planter, which we believe may have had some influence on our stands and our stand counts. This is supposed to be a precision planter, so it was supposed to provide better stands. So for the experiment, we went out and counted plants 14 days after planting. So pretty much as soon as we could, uh, we had enough to count after emergence. And then we did root ratings at that same time. We dig five roots from the outer rows of our plots and then we rated them on a zero to 10 with zero being the worst. And then at the end of the year, we harvested the middle two rows of the field. So we also took soil samples to monitor for insect pests. We never saw a difference though from treatment to treatment, which isn't a surprise because uh, most of our treatments weren't actually killing the pests. And also out in the field, you're not going to have real consistent pest populations below ground. Uh, it's going to be kind of patchy. One of the things we noticed right away, and this wasn't just in these two plots, is that our treatments really affected stand counts. So can you guess what's uh, boxed in in red and what's boxed in in blue? Well, the red was an untreated plot and the blue was a treated plot. So we did see that we had better stands just overall when we were visually observing in the treated plots. Another thing we noticed right away is that our treated roots uh, were more robust. They had more root hairs. Overall, the plants looked healthier. These were actually dug at the same time, same sunflower variety, but and I'm not telling you what treatment, it's just a treatment, looked like we were having much healthier early season root tissue. Uh, and this, this uh, we continued doing the root ratings throughout the year, but overall, it looked like having treatments improved root health which is ideal because those roots are pulling up moisture and nutrients. If you have healthier root systems, you will have healthier plants. But it gets a little interesting when we actually start looking at the data. So over here, we have two y-axes, so I'll walk you through it. On this one here, we have plants per acre. So these are stand counts in the thousands. And then over on this one, we have a root rating injury scale. So uh, one being severe, uh, 10 being no, it looks like these got switched around on us uh, from what I put on that first slide, so I apologize. But what we see here is that for our stands, we didn't really see a consistent effect. Uh, so our untreated here, we saw some evidence that the lower rate cruiser uh, was significantly different from our untreated, but it was also significantly different from our high rate cruiser. And then we saw that the Ethos XB, which is a insecticide plus a biological agent, actually did pretty well too for stand. If we look at our root rating, there was the evidence that you want to have a treatment. So our untreated control was about five. Most of our treatments were above that, uh, so they were healthier. Our Ethos XB was actually pretty low. So we had nice stands, but poor root ratings. And our best root rating came from Capture LFR. So that's one of our inferro treatments. When we look at yield from the first year in 2016 of the study, 
Again, it's kind of all over the place. So we attributed this maybe in the stand counts to the planter that was used. But if we look here, some of the treatments actually did numerically worse, but not significantly worse than the untreated control. And nothing actually yielded much better than our untreated control. So uh, we weren't seeing a lot of evidence that you know there's a major benefit to the use of these treatments, aside from we had healthier root tissue. So we conducted the study again in 2017. Again, plants per acre uh, and then our root rating. So this again, one severe, 10 equals none. Our stand counts from 2017 were a lot different. So we actually see that some of our best stands were in our untreated control, our cruiser, both rates. And then we saw a drop off for our Ethos XB and our capture LFR. So that was kind of a surprise because in the previous year, both of these had done pretty well. When we look at our root rating though, we see that the untreated was pretty low. Again, Ethos XB was pretty low. Our highest ones were the Mustang Max and again, Capture LFR. So our inferos look like they're probably having better root ratings. But when we look at the yield, we actually had two locations, uh, I believe for yield, but the first one was our Volga in 2017. So we don't grow sunflowers near uh, Volga, but we had wireworm populations because this had been in uh, a wheat rotation for a long period of time and we actually had some wireworm pressure but we didn't see any significant differences in our yield. And if you notice, yield was pretty good. We had a lot of moisture in 2017. Uh, and that might've been part of the reason why we didn't see a lot of treatment effects. For 2017 and Oneida location, we did see yield responses, but it wasn't what we would expect. Again, our higher rate crews are actually yielded worse, uh, not significantly, but numerically worse than our normal rate cruiser. Ethos XB did not yield well, and our best yielding varieties, uh, they were significantly different from two of our other treatments, were Mustang Max and Capture LFR, but they weren't significantly different from our untreated control. So, uh, you know, we might have had some stand variation due to our planters. One of the things we always uh, have talked about with this study is that small plots probably weren't, our small plots weren't big enough uh, to actually really get an idea. And that's a challenge with sunflower that we've learned in the last few years is uh, small plot research can be very variable uh, because one plant in a sunflower plot can make a big difference. Uh, and, you know, if something came in and ate that plant that wasn't an insect pest, or if the planter just skipped, uh, it can have a huge impact on what we're looking at. It does look like overall the inferos provided better root protection in terms of the root ratings. The yield was very variable. However, where we did have pressure and it wasn't quite as wet, it looked like the inferos probably were the way to go. So that is all I have for you today. Uh, since there were a couple studies, I'd like to thank the National Sunflower Association as well as South Dakota Oil Seeds Council for your uh, funding for those studies and the opportunity to, con to conduct them. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, it looks like there are a couple in the Q&A. I'll be happy to answer those. If you need to get a hold of me during the growing season, I have my office number here for the phone. Uh, but a lot of times if I'm not in the office, I'll always have my phone on me and I can check my email. So if you need me to look at an insect, uh, sometimes the easiest way is to email a picture of that or get a hold of me and we can you can send me a picture of the insect that you're having issues with or I can come scout a field. So I'm always happy to do that though. So Pat, I'll turn it over to you so you can put your survey up and uh, QR code, and I'll take a look at these answer, or questions and try to provide some answers. Sure, so we are, yeah, right at the, <clears throat> close to the end of our hour. So yeah, Ruth, if you wanna go ahead and share that QR code um, with everybody, and then, yeah, Matt, get that poll up, and I will, I will give everybody a second to do that poll. All right, I'm going to, take this opportunity to answer our couple of the questions. Uh, the first was, could North Dakota's uh, reduced susceptibility or uh, not really seen that be due to a lack of pressure for red sunflower seed weevils? I, I think there's probably something to that in terms of they, they haven't had these very large populations. However, I do think that uh, just in looking at things, we probably, 
it might be kind of a vicious cycle that's happening in South Dakota where we've had these very large populations and they've been getting treated. And as a result, we may have had this uh, reduced susceptibility develop here. Uh, so there, that could be part of it. But I do think that their lower populations, they still have some, but just not what we've been seeing probably contribute to that to some extent. And then another question is, uh, do we use pheromone traps to monitor populations of adult head moth and banded sunflower moth? So uh, that's a great question, Allison. Uh, we are ordering traps this year. We haven't been in the past. Uh, however, we've decided that that's something we probably need to be doing to provide some information to our stakeholders and just uh, help and help and you know doing some targeted management of those pests. So we're going to be putting up pheromone traps at several locations this year in South Dakota to monitor both of those populations. So hopefully they start arriving pretty soon. We ordered them, I believe about a week or two ago. So we wanted to make sure we could get some before the growing season started, but uh, we will be doing that this year to really try to up our, up our assistance with the scouting and just keep track of uh, the populations within the state. So some other notes for everyone. Um, looks like Ruth put in the chat there links for um, ordering the pet copies of the pest management guide. Those are also um, available uh, digital copies just on the website. Um, and then she's also has a, a link there too if you wanna watch any of the previous recordings um, of these webinars on, on YouTube. Um, so I think Matt, can we go ahead and transition to our informal discussion? Just bring everybody in.